Okay, I think it's time we can start. Um, how are you today? How was your spring break? Not long enough. Not long enough. Nothing is long enough, you know. <laughs> how was the exam? Was okay? Was not terrible at all? The last question in undergraduate students, that's usually for graduate students' question. So you did great. And I'm still working on um, almost done grading, but I, I need to go a few more and then make sure consistency in my grading. And then Wednesday, most likely, you get that return. Okay? All right. Um, my spring break, um, well, you know, faculty that usually don't have spring break. <laughs> so I was working on proposal, but I was in Tokyo. I was taking care of my mom, and you know, I was there, but working from there. But I had an opportunity to visit this nursery in Fukushima, which is middle of nowhere. So I took bullet train for two hours, and then took um, a rental car. Uh, actually, somebody who was taking care of me um, drove me to there. But anyway, I'm going to show you. Um, uh, it's a nursery doing a grafted plant production. For, for where is it? Oh, where? Um, Fukushima Prefecture. So it's a nose from Tokyo. Mm -hmm. You know the power plant collapsed? Yeah. That's yeah. Fukushima, yeah. coastal yeah. area, but it's inland, so it's, it's not a dangerous area. Um, so the reason I was there is because I wanted to see Kind of reflecting, huh? I wanted to see the automatic grafting operation. This company has 100% automation, so there is no manual grafting. I, um, some of you know, working on grafting, vegetable grafting, and uh, I'm organizing a tour for U.S. growers, and this is a candidate location, so I thought I'm going to go and see it. So it's a uh, um, semi-automated grafting. Um, Facility, basically one unit can graph probably eight times more than one person can do, but requires minimum of three people assisting. One person feeding scion, which is fruiting part. Another person is assisting, to, uh, to assisting by feeding uh, rootstock, which is a root, you know, developing uh, variety. And then the last person is basically quality check right here. Um, so the, the machine is grafting, and then the result, so that, so that this, these people basically checking the quality of the grafts. But this is the first one I have seen, 100% um, you know, automated grafting. So many others, mostly manual grafting because it's more reliable but according to them once you get used to and machine is working for their type of plants it's very reliable so it's it's interesting to see they got um, that semi-automated machine i think they got five or six of them and they got new um, fully automated machine which is same speed or a little bit better um, and then just one person assisting, so just feeding the plants to the machine and ev everything is done. Is Courtney. Any, by any chance, have any statistics on like, the percentage? The, the success rate? Success? Yeah, so the success rate they're looking at is 90 to 95%. So better than relying on untrained workers. So that's why they want to use machine. Caitlin. Ninety-five, ninety-five to 100%. Yeah, so a little bit less. Yes? So the actual grafting is done by a machine, not a person? Not by person, right. The machine does that. Yeah, so um, if I have a chance, I will show you the video. Yeah, so that's, okay, so here you go. So we have mainly worked on aerial environment, light, temperature, CO2, um, gas, um, air, circulation, wind, you know, all these factors in the aerial environment, remember? And now, this week, we are looking at root zone environment. And root zone, as you know, it's very important. 
and hydroponic technologies made us possible to optimize the root zone environment. Um, today's topic is the nutrition, plant nutrition. Usually you learn whole semester just talking about nutrition, plant nutrition, but this one is a condensed version very much. And then Wednesday we are going to talk about substrate, physical and chemical properties of substrate, which is quite similar to soil science or soil physics, but more you know, horticultural, um, uh, controlled environment uh, application, that's substrate. So the goal of this week is um, basically you're going to understand the interactions between plant physiology and root zone environment and nutrient uptake. So that's your goal this week. And then next week, you are going to learn more basic physiology, like uh, uh, water relation, water potential, uh, photosynthesis, sink source relationship, and all that. And then you will be ready to talk about systems, so that um, getting into the system. You know, we started with the factors, a uh, bunch of factors was kind of overwhelming for you because bunch of information. And then we built the understanding of canopy, microenvironment, you know, interactions, uh, uh, plant canopy environment. And then now looking at root zone and then going into a little bit of inside physiology and then start talking about systems. Okay? All right, good. It's gonna be fun, all right? <laughs> All right, okay, so um, there are several reading um, materials in the D2L now. Um, the, the only one I want you to read um, carefully is this one. Uh, it's about 20 pages. It, it is from this textbook, Plant Physiology textbook. And uh, um, the reason I picked this because it's written in a way or in a, in, in, in in a, in a um, uh, uh, good relationship with agricultural applications. That's why I picked this one. And it's easy to read. And then just a good um, review of you know, different elemental um, uh, uh, nutrient um, uh, affecting plant and how important it is. So that's what you are going to review, particularly for those who never had a chance to learn the plant nutrition before, it's good to learn. Um, and then additional readings from uh, Growth Chamber Handbook, which the whole you know, chapter is available online, so I have a link to each chapter. One is uh, a substrate or a plant culture in substrate, and the other one is hydroponics. So, so those are uh, sort of practical information for growing plants in hydroponics or substrate uh, media. So that's two additional readings. All right, so um, there are you know, essential nutrients or micro elements or macro elements, and then um, also essential elements, but you are not gonna give as fertilizers. Basically 13 important elements you need to provide either as a fertilizers or as existing in, in if it is soil-based culture, you can expect some of the um, uh, nutrients available in the soil. So you really don't add by, uh, by you know, feeding as a fertilizer. But in a hydroponic solution, because substrate doesn't have that, so you have to provide everything, 13 different elements. And some of them are called micronutrients because the necessary concentration is much larger than the others. The others are called micronutrients because the concentration range is, is very small. Um, and carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, those are not gonna be fertilizers, but essential to build the plant body, right? Um, you, you all know that, carbohydrate, C and H and O. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through, and some of the information, again, it's a recap or review of what you learn in uh, plant nutrition or biology or plant biology. So you may not, you know, so excited. Um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, those are uh, very important micronutrients. Um, nitrogen is uh, basically the compounds 
um, uh, or the component of uh, amino acid there for protein, so it's very important. Enzymes, you know, out of protein, so it's, it's very important. It's needless to say that. Phosphorus is a, a component of sugar, um, you know, all these, um, and then key role in energy transfer, ATP. Um, so that's, so without phosphorus, the photosynthesis doesn't run. So it's very important component. Potassium, it's a very important for uh, uh, activating enzyme and, uh, uh, you know, osmotic balance, um, you know, adjusting osmotic balance. And then also translocation of carbohydrate. Uh, potassium is known to be uh, taking an important role. Um, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. So those are all uh, important uh, 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 micronutrients. So you can read that, you know, just basically talking about, for example, magnesium is a component of chlorophyll. That's why very important. Sulfur, um, some of the amino acids coming from sulfur, or the, uh, including sulfur. So that's including sulfur, for example, in uh, Blasica glucosinolates is a sulfur containing compounds. And then that is a sort of pepper leaf flavor, adding compounds. And then you really have a good um, spicy flavor when you have a lot of sulfur. Um, opposite case is a sweet onion. If you have a lot of sulfur, you can't really get sweet onion. You have to select the soil that doesn't have sulfur so that um, you can get sweet onion. So the sulfur is quite interesting um, element for plant growth and uh, content. Um, iron, manganese, uh, manganese, and zinc, and copper, you can read all that. It's kind of boring, so I'm gonna skip this. Um, so that those are all important, right? Um, so here, um, one thing you need to understand is there are a group of ions um, charged positively, and there are a group of ions charged negatively. So the positively charged um, ions are going to be called uh, cations, negative ones, anions, okay? And then it's very important to um, uh, maintain the electric charge, um, you know, between the plasma membrane, so the inside the cell and outside the cell. Um, you know, um, plants need to maintain the charge so that when plants take up cations, they have to balance out ex exchanging with another cation to the outside. So I'm gonna talk about that in uh, uh, nitrogen. Um, but anyway, so this is sort of um, the list of cations and anions. Ammonium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and iron, manganese, and zinc, and copper. Anions, uh, phosphorus, uh, nitrate, sulfur, boron, uh, molybdenum, and chloride. So those are the um, anions. Okay, so here is uh, quite important information. There are three ways for plants to take up um, or absorb and transport um, uh, ions. Uh, number one, diffusion. What is diffusion? Diffusion is the transportation um, according to the concentration difference. So the high concentration side to the low concentration side, diffusion. Right, and the second mechanism to absorb ion or transport is a mass flow. Mass flow, what is mass flow? So it's a basically the big flow of water, okay? So what is causing big flow of water in the plant system? Which is transpiration, okay? So the transpiration is the driving, fo uh, driving force of mass flow and mass flow is driving some of the nutrients available to get absorbed or transported within the plant. So that is a xylem, you know, the xylem, um, uh, that's the flux driven by trans, uh, transpiration and uh, uh, internal transport of certain ions such as calcium and magnesium pretty much driven by mass flow. So in another word, if there is no, no transpiration going on, there is no mass flow, and that means no uptake of calcium magnesium or the, the moving calcium magnesium in the plant system. Okay, so that's a second important mechanism to, to get ion absorbed and transport. Um, and then also plants have um, 
active transportation mechanisms, um, uh, ion channels or pumps, and that is actively using energy, actively selectively taking up, um, uh, for example, uh, potassium. Um, they have uh, uh, channels to uptake that, and calcium too. So, um, so those three, um, and then again, important note is the mass flow largely contributes to calcium and magnesium transport. This information is very important to understand some of the deficiency um, we typically see in a controlled uh, environment agriculture setting. Okay, so nutritional disorders and toxicity. Um, so this is a typical um, response curve uh, relative to the concentration. So this is a concentration of whatever the uh, nutrient um, uh, uh, in the tissue. Um, and uh, when the tissue concentration declines, then the growth and yield um, as a result is going to be restricted. So that's the deficiency zone. So that it has, you have to provide you know, good amount of um, nutrients to the plants to make sure the growth and yield are not going to be limited by the, by the lack of nutrients or excessive amount of nutrients. Excessive amount of nutrients uh, give you or give the plants toxicity so that they show toxicity symptom uh, by high concentration. And then as a result, the growth is uh, restricted as well. So this is a typical response. Um, and uh, another important information um, uh, is that there are mobile and immobile uh, uh, elements, nutritional elements. Um, so mobile meaning from old leaves to young leaves, those elements like nitrogen, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, chlorine or chloride, sodium, zinc, molybdenum, those can easily move from old leaves and new leaves. So plants want to support new growth, the growing tip and new growth. And then when the, the nutrients supply from the roots, are not going to be enough, then they want to translocate the available nutrients from the old leaves to the new leaves. But some of the elements are not going to be moved. And those are calcium, sulfur, iron, boron, and copper. So those never move. Once it is in that leaf, it's not going to be um, mobilized and then transported to the new growth. So if there is deficiency happening, in that case, you know, um, uh, uh, deficiency happening. Mobile elements show the deficiency in the old leaves, all right? Because new leaves can get whatever available in the plant system, translocated to the new growth. Immobile elements, such as calcium or iron, show the deficiency in the new tissue, so the new growing tip show the deficiency. For example, yellow leaves. Iron deficiency typically in the new leaves because they can't, they don't have enough supply. They don't, they, they can't use the stock, I mean the storage iron in the old leaves. Therefore, it shows symptom in the new leaves. So knowing, you know, mobile versus immobile, um, the elemental nutrients um, is very important to judge if something happening, for example, potassium, and then also um, iron, both can show um, intervenal chlorosis, so the yellowing in leaves. But whether it is old leaves, whether it is new leaves, that would tell you if it is, if it is uh, iron deficiency or potassium deficiency. So it's a very important information to judge. Um, Okay, so this is um, the uh, summary of nitrogen function in plants. Um, as you know, amino acid protein, uh, nucleic acid, those are all containing nitrogen, so you know it's very important. Um, and always highest nitrogen concentration in new leaves because it's easily translocated. Um, and then the new leaves attract because it, it has a demand 
um, uh, developing amino acids and proteins there. Um, high mobility from old to new, new tissue. Uh, typical deficiencies, uh, overall stunted growth, slow growth, because nitrogen is very important element for plant growth. And yellowing lower leaves, because lower leaves, meaning older leaves, um, nitrogen is translocated to support the new leaves. So deficiency usually start in the older leaves. Um, toxicity too dark um, is one thing you notice. And then also too vegetative, too vigorous growth. Tomatoes typically show that, and let us too, if you have huge amount of nitrogen in a nutrient solution, it gets really vigorous and bulky too much vigorous, and then just giving up the, the you know, flowers. So you might see flower abortion, fruit abortion, because of the too much vegetative coming from the too much nitrogen supply. Okay, so that's typical um, nitrogen response. And this is um, a picture I have. Um, so this is a low nitrogen, um, a tomato plants grown under low nitrogen. And this is a, a standard nitrogen. Um, and uh, first of all, the color is very different. And then also, as you can see, lower leaves started yellow, and that is typical symptom um, nitrogen deficiency. And uh, um, smaller growth or smaller uh, mass compared to uh, a standard growth on your right. Um, nitrogen is fixed. Um, plants li like to take nitrogen in the form of nitrate and then um, reduce to uh, ammonium form. And then ammonium is going to be introduced or uh, included in uh, um, amino acid uh, synthesis. And then uh, photosynthesis is running to um, provide what we call carbon skeletons, and then um, uh, you know, producing all kinds of, all kinds of compounds. Um, so it's very important, you know, to synthesis, nitrogen synthesis, and then also or nitrogen fixation, and then also carbon fixation, too, hands in hand, um, uh, uh, to run the normal physiology. And uh, so there are two forms of nitrogen plants can take up, right? Um, most plants prefer... Um, nitrate form of nitrogen, I call nitrate nitrogen, um, over ammonium form of nitrogen, which is ammonium nitrogen. Um, and uh, um, in the field production, soil production, um, the ratio of those two, you know, ammonium nitrogen and nitrate nitrogen, um, is not studied uh, because there is no use to study that. Um, in the uh, open field, there is a big capacity in the soil to attract um, ammonium nitrogen and then reduce to nitrate um, or convert to nitrate. So therefore, it's, 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 it's really not so much demand to understand the ratio in the fertilizer. But I know that in the field, you mix some form in the, uh, in the form of let me go back again. In the field, I know that the fertilizer contains some nitrogen in the form of nitrate so that plants can easily take up. But if you increase that amount, nitrate amount, in the open field, in the soil, then nitrate tends to uh, reach out because the soil has a capacity to attract the cation rather than anion. And nitrate is an uh, anion. So negatively charged, not cation, but ammonium is cation, so the positively charged. And positively charged ions, uh, uh, positively charged ions, ions, sorry, um, tend to be attracted by the surface of the soil particles because those are charged negatively. Soil surface is charged negatively. So it's, it's a cation exchange capacity. Is that something you, you learn in the soil science? And then also Wednesday, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But anyway, so um, if you provide too much nitrate uh, fertilizer, then it, it tends to reach 
into the uh, water stream. So, it, so that's why in a soil system, you, don't, you have to be careful to put too much nitrate fertilizer. But in the hydroponics, you really have a control. You don't discharge too much. And then usually, um, discharge rate is minimum. So you can actually optimize the ratio of nitrate form and ammonium form. And tomato and cucumber and lettuce, they can grow 100% nitrate. You don't need ammonium form at all. However, some crops um, prefer to have a small percentage of ammonium form of nitrogen. And I know that strawberry is one of them. 10% ammonium form is really good. Um, so there is a optimum range, crop specific optimum range. Typically small amount of ammonium mixed in um, uh, 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 nitrate, uh, 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 nitrate nitrogen. Okay, and then also important thing you, you, you might want to remember is uh, that ratio affects a lot to the pH in the hydroponic or soilless culture um, because one is uh, anion, the other one is cation. So uh, uptaking affect the pH. Uh, I'll show you in a minute. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so um, here, this is a diagram, very simplified diagram showing um, Ammonium form of nitrogen is taken up, and then plant needs to discharge um, hydrogen um, ion um, to balance out the um, uh, 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 charge, electric charge. Um, uh, so therefore, when plants are growing in the nutrient solution, having a good amount of nit uh, ammonium nitrogen, then pH tend to decrease, you know, more um, acid, right, um, hydrogen ion concentration, so more acid. Um, opposite way, when plants are growing nitrate, you know, uh, based fertilizer, more nitrate, um, then uh, taking up nitrate, nitrogen, because this is anion, they need to discharge the um, uh, hydroxide ion, all right? Or some plants actually take up um, hydrogen ion too. So basically, either way, you know, either way, that would increase the pH, right? Increase the pH because it would reduce the solution um, hydrogen concentration, all right? So that's why if you're familiar with hydroponics, you know, you do um, pH measurement and drip and drain. A drip is the incoming nutrient solution and drain is the drainage. And drainage is usually pH is higher, right? So the incoming pH may be about six, but outgoing is 6.5, right? Never have 5.5 or five um, because the kind of nutrient solution you are using here is 100% um, uh, nitrate nitrogen as a nitrogen source. Therefore, you know, this is happening. Um, therefore, pH is increasing. Okay? Um, so, yeah, so um, here, plants can generally grow with only nitrate nitrogen. That's why we are using 100%. And nowadays, also uh, uh, sourcing ammonium nitrogen um, uh, fertilizer, ammonium nitrogen containing salts, sometimes very difficult. So that's why um, it's easy to stick with uh, nitrate nitrogen. Um, so for strawberry, because we want to include 10% of nitrogen in the form of ammonia, therefore we have to use um, ammonium sulfate. It used to be a, a ammonium nitrate, which is not going to be available because of the homeland security issue. Um, so it's, it's more challenging now. It used to be much easier to, to locate. Um, so anyway, um, yes? Oh, okay. 
Okay. Is it pure hydroponic grade? Uh, it'll do solution grade. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the information. All right. So, um, and uh, I mentioned that already, the solution pH. Um, and then another issue, particularly for leafy crop, um, nitrate, if you have 100% nitrate concentration, or 100% um, nitrogen in a nitrate form, and then having a huge nitrogen concentration, um, under the condition, particularly like a winter, not so much, you know, the solar radiation, therefore plants growing slowly, but still taking up nitrogen in the form of nitrate, um, nitrate concentration in the tissue tends to be really high. And then there's a concern, um, not in this country, but particularly European countries uh, uh, paying more attention to the potential uh, carcinogenic action of nitrate in a, in a leafy crop. So they have a limitation uh, in terms of nitrate. Uh, I think the limitation is 2,000, sometimes 4,000, depending on the countries. Um, we don't have that because uh, um, there's an argument, um, uh, you know, if, if there is uh, enough data showing the negative impact to the human body. And so we don't have that regulation yet in this country. But, you know, you, it's good to know. Um, typical way to reduce is just reduce the, the nitrate concentration before harvesting leafy crop and a few days of just no nitrogen solution would dilute the, because it's quickly incorporated into amino acid. Once it is incorporated into amino acids by uh, um, nitrogen fixation, then it's no problem. So you said they think that it causes, it can cause like permanent damage to that tissue? Yeah, so I think, um, I forgot what it is, but it was converted nitrate in the tissue it's converted to something which is carcinogenic. So the nitrate itself is not harmful, but uh, whatever the, the result, resulting compound uh, in the human body is... It like, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what other countries are concerned about. So that's why they put the uh, maximum concentration. Um, yeah, so... So that's something you probably want to know, um, other countries' regulation. Okay, so um, in terms of toxicity, um, nitrogen um, in the form of ammonia, um, so ammonium nitrogen, if the concentration is too much, usually have toxicity. Okay, so you don't grow solution containing a lot of ammonium nitrogen over uh, nitrate nitrogen. So that's why I say usually a very small amount of ammonium nitrogen relative to uh, nitrate nitrogen. And then also another thing is the um, cations um, compete each other. So if you have a massive amount of one kind of cations, particularly um, uh, calcium, magnesium, potassium, um, those compete each other to get absorbed because the plant root surface is again negatively charged. So, you know, attracting positively charged ions. And then so if one concentration is dominating, then it typically get, you know, others exclude. So, so we, we call competition among cations. So if you have a massive amount of ammonium um, nitrogen, you might have calcium deficiency or magnesium deficiency as a result of that even though calcium and magnesium in a solution is plenty, but because of one cation is dominating and that is causing competition. All right, and then there is a, a interaction between concentration of um, ammonia, ammonium nitrogen and nitrate nitrogen, and then also substrate. So the substrate properties we are learning on Wednesday, um, cation exchange, which is a, 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 a very important properties. And then uh, those two are species, th these are the floriculture ornamental species, but grown under five different um, ammonium nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen ratio. 100% uh, uh, nit uh, nitrate nitrogen, 
all the way to 100% um, ammonium nitrogen. So the in between, so 25, 75, which is number two. This is 50, 50, 75, 25. And then if you look at this rock wall, um, the difference is very clear. So the low um, concentration of uh, ammonium nitrogen um, um, is, is okay, but the, if you add 25% ammonium nitrogen and 75% nitrate nitrogen, the plant response is much better. So that, that's what I'm saying. There is an optimum concentration range in, in terms of the form of nitrogen. But beyond that, it, it's basically toxicity of ammonium nitrogen coming up. Um, when the substrate is peat-based, or the soil, you know, you don't see that response. Why? Because substrate, those substrates, soil and peat, have a very high cation exchange capacity. So that basically having a buffer in terms of ammonium nitrogen, because ammonia is a positively charged cation. So it basically attracts those you know, um, ammonium, so reducing the availability to the plants. Therefore, plants don't show um, big difference. Uh, it might show a slightly difference in between one and two, but it doesn't show huge reduction of growth in terms of toxicity. So again, this is a very important information, substrate and fertilizer interactions in terms of plant growth, plant response, okay? All right. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, so the, um, this is a peat-based substrate, so I don't think it's 100% peat. It's probably mixed with vermiculite to neutralize. It's typical. And maybe you have some other, I don't know exactly what substrate in this experiment. All right. All right, and then uh, plants seems to have preference. Um, this doesn't mean they grow really well under, um, uh, you know, one kind of form of nitrogen. But this information is probably important when you are growing in a hydroponic solution in a circulated system because which one to take, you know, which one, either ammonium form or nitrogen, or ammonium nitrogen or nitrate nitrogen, which one is more uh, taken up easily would affect the pH of the uh, nutrient solution. So like uh, greenhouse, we have tomato production greenhouse, which is a one-way discharge system. You never recirculate. So you don't really need to worry about the resulting pH as long as it is in a good range. But if it is nutrient recirculation system, um, you know, pond system, floating system, or um, like indoor growing system, multi-layer and, and you know, circulating, and pH changes a lot depending on how plants take up the uh, nitrogen. So, um, and then it seems to be, depending on pH, whichever um, uh, they prefer seems to be different. For example, um, where is the good example? Um, turnip, turnip, maize, pepper, strawberry. Uh, hmm? I don't have a good example. Oh, here, um, cabbage um, under pH 7, um, similar rate between uh, um, ammonium and nitrogen, ammonium and nitrate nitrogen um, uptake. But pH 5, it seems to be um, nitrate preferred um, uptake. So that's also um, reported in, in the literature. All right. so. So that's about nitrogen. And then uh, um, phosphorus in plants, again, uh, very important uh, f uh, uh, because it's an uh, energy um, uh, uh, transfer. Um, ATP um, uh, is uh, containing uh, phosphorus. 
uh, and then also um, deficiency, uh, you see slow growth. And for whatever the reason, um, when phosphorus is depleted, you see anthocyanin development in, uh, in, uh, in uh, um, the lower side of the leaves. Um, and then I don't exactly know the mechanism for this. Um, there might be already known. Um, but you see that purple color, and it's typically um, um, phosphorus deficiency. Um, and what else I need to, yeah, so that, and then also high mobility from old to new tissue, so the deficiency usually shows in the older leaves, lower leaves. That's phosphorus, all right. And potassium, um, that's also mobile. Therefore, um, you see a deficiency in uh, uh, lower leaves, and intervenal chlorosis is one of the typical uh, symptoms like this, um, lower leaves, potassium deficiency. Um, that's for tomato. And then uh, if you have a massive amount of potassium, potassium typically it's high concentration in the nutrient solution anyway, but if you have much more you know, concentration, then it might start affecting calcium and magnesium because um, comp competition going within the cations. All right. And calcium uh, is very important, um, you know, involved in the many um, enzyme reactions, and then also calcium sometimes um, acts as a very important signal to the plants. Um, and, um, but low mobility from old tissue and new tissue and calcium transportation or uptake is pretty much mass flow driven. So it's very much associated with transpiration rate, as I mentioned earlier. And typical deficiency, tepan, blossom and rot, those are very important deficiency symptoms. And um, growers who don't understand calcium and calcium uptake driven by mass flow typically make wrong decision to add more calcium in the nutrient solution. Okay, if you see calcium deficiency, if you don't understand what is causing that, you know, typically grower add more calcium and that doesn't help because calcium is not by diffusion, it's, it's by um, trans mass flow, trans uh, transpiration driven mass flow. So you really need to work on transpiration. Okay, so that's the, the, the only way to solve the calcium deficiency when, you know, it is happening. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about calcium deficiency today, right? Um, and then if you have a massive amount of calcium, for example, growers, you know, oh, there's a calcium deficiency, I need to put more calcium in the root zone. If you increase the calcium, then it tends to reduce magnesium uptake, and then it plants start showing magnesium deficiency as well. So that's typical competition-related uh, deficiencies. All right. Calcium deficiency, tipan, which I never seen in tomato. Um, have you guys seen tomato tipan like that? You have? Um, what occasions do you see tipan of tomato? Tipan is more for me lettuce and strawberries. I haven't seen tomato tipan. So it's maybe not, tip, it's, it's a tissue bond with chemical, chemical bond maybe, not exactly calcium deficiency. Maybe, I don't know. But anyway, so tip bond and uh, blossom endolot. Blossom endolot is this one. It, what kind of conditions you get blossom endolot? For those who know tomato growing? Too humid. Too humid. Um, and anything else? Say that again? Warmer temperature. Water temperature? Warmer temperature. Oh, high temperature, warmer temperature. Yeah, the temperature high and then blossom end Or maybe the opposite case, very dry, very dry situation. Or the nutrient, well, it's a, it is a nutrient deficiency. Well, if you have calcium precipitation in a, in a solution, you might have it, yeah, that's too. But 
this is a deficiency, so the calcium is not translocated to the fast-growing tissue, distal end of tomato or the shoot tip. Okay, so that's why calcium deficiency. So um, this is a long statement, but it's very important, so I'm going to go one by one. So blossom and rot, okay, is a physical disorder caused by calcium deficiency in the tissue. And as I emphasized many times, calcium is taken up and transported by mass flow in xylem driven by transpiration. Okay, driven by transpiration. Yet, it shows in tomato, right? Tomato, tomato, fruit, don't have stomata. The leaves have. So the massive amount of driving force are actually happening in leaves, not in tomato fruit. So the allocation of calcium is always limited to the fruit. Okay? Leaves are fine. You know, it's always going massive amount of translocation because of the mass flow. But tomato is limited. So certain conditions that limit even further the allocation of water going into the fruit, then you start having blossom and rot. Okay, it's very important understanding. So um, under the conditions that suppress transpiration, um, xylem flow containing calcium from the roots, you know, the, the nutrient, to the fruit is suppressed and therefore calcium flux to the fruit is reduced. And typical condition I know is a high salts in the root, so the EC is too high, and limiting mass flow. EC is uh, basically um, high salt concentrations, and so that is reducing uh, water potential or increasing uh, osmosis. So it's difficult to take up water from the salty water, therefore reduce the flux, reduce the allocation to the fruit, therefore calcium deficiency happens. And then also conditions that induce excessive transpiration from the leaf. And then in that case, you know, because massive flux going through the leaf, therefore um, allocation to the fruit is going to be limited because the, the um, we call targar, so that usually plants are pressurized, right? So the positive pressure is going to be reduced a little bit, so that would reduce the allocation of sap flow, xylem flow, to the fruit. Therefore, dry conditions, you know, plants are growing in, you know, humid nighttime, and suddenly the vents open, dry air comes in, and then plants might show wilting, and if that condition continues, allocation of the uh, xylem flux to the fruit is going to be reduced, therefore calcium deficiency. All right. So why in the blossom end? Because that's the location xylem density is very much limited. Therefore, the supply you know, chains are not going to be enough. So that's, that's why. So um, uh, yeah, so that's why you see calcium deficiency. And then when you see that, it's already too late, right? Um, if you're growers, you, you, it starts when plants, or the, the fruit is much, much smaller. So the more exponential, fast growing stage. And that is the beginning of blossom end. And then it's, it's already shown in here, which probably happened several weeks ago. Okay, so. So the solution is basically water management. Transpiration management is the solution for blossom and rot. What would be the problem if you have blossom and rot in like, the whole plant? Like, for example, you have a red plant, and then there's a certain variety, and you have like three or four plants that are sick of blossom and rot. Like, all the fruit, all the harvest you get from those plants have blossom and rot. What is the cause of that? Um, so the question is, if there's a row of plants and only a few plants are showing blossom and rot, what would be the cause? So that there's assumption that environment is uniform, but I'm not sure the root zone is. For example, um, the drip, drip, drip irrigation for that section may not be working enough. Therefore, plants are taking up, you know, water and con concentrating the root zone salts. 
and that might affect the water uptake, and then that would cause blossom end rot, potentially. You are not measuring, particularly in the greenhouse, when we do a, a hydroponic management, you measure representative section to, based on the assumption that everything is maintained in the same way. But if the dripper is not working or clogged, and then that particular section do not have the exactly the same root zone conditions, that could be the reason. That could be the reason. So there are multiple reasons. Um, but anyway, if you see blossom end rot, the, the correct answer is it's something um, to do with transpiration. Either too much transpiration going on to reduce the location, or too little transpiration because of the difficulty to take up water from the root zone. Okay? All right. One more calcium deficiency. Tip burn. Tip burn of lettuce. Um, how many of you actually grow lettuce, had lettuce before? Yeah, so have you guys had tip burn before? And what's the typical condition of tip burn of lettuce? Well, what's the typical conditions having tip burn in your greenhouse? Low airflow, low airflow. Low airflow. High temperature, okay, yeah, so it's again calcium deficiency, it's mass flow driven, all right? So um, the shoot tip is a fast growing portion of the plants, okay? So it requires a lot of calcium. Calcium is a very important element, right? To build, you know, the, the cell wall, everything. And uh, when plants are growing very fast, Okay, plants are growing very fast. Typically, tip burn happens. So, um, because plants are growing too fast, so the, the calcium doesn't catch up. So that's why, you know, the lettuce tip burn happens. Um, so the typical condition um, in little airflow is one thing. Um, and then well-known condition is too much sunlight. So the DLI, remember DLI, daily light integral? Daily light integral is too high. For example, head lettuce, we know that um, 12 to 15, it's sort of marginal um, DLI, not to cause tip burn. Beyond that, you might be prepared, you might want to prepare to have tip burn in your system. So for growers who want to grow the lettuce heads really fast so that yield is good, turnover is quick, it's really challenging, you know, because the, the only traditional solution for tip burn of lettuce was reducing growth. Shading, right, to reduce the growth. Or lowering temperature, if it is warm, you know, um, if it is winter time, easy to lower the temperature. Slow down the growth. So it was not welcomed solution because they usually want to maximize, they wanna inject CO2, they wanna put supplemental lighting, they wanna fast, you know, growth. So it was a difficult, um, uh, you know, disorder to handle. And then again, this is transpiration related. So now, you know, TJ said that the airflow and the corner also, you know, agree with that. Airflow is the key technology actually developed in 19, 80s and 90s, and then Cornell University uh, picked up the finding and then implemented it as a greenhouse technology. So if you, if you look at lettuce production facilities, sometimes you see this kind of vertical airflow fans facing down, and instead of like our greenhouse, tomato greenhouse, facing sideways, mixing air like this, they are mixing air that, like this, all right? Why? Because they want to put the airflow hitting the lettuce head. Why? TJ, you said airflow is limited, then you have tip on. Why? Because of transpiration. Why airflow and transpiration? Yeah, yeah, okay, so the airflow, and how airflow promote transpiration. Anyone? Courtney. I was gonna say the increased airflow would um, limit or decrease the, the barrier region. And that's what, what do you call that? 
boundary layer. Yeah, so the airflow reduced the boundary layer, the resistance to the transpiration, enhanced the transpiration, and then more calcium supply to the shoot tip. Okay, so let us structure shoot tip is inside, right? It's facing up, so it's, it's sort of exposed to the, to the um, aerial part, but sitting there, so there's a dip there, right? So air is not moving in that microclimate, okay? So by putting fans vertically downward, it reduces the boundary layer around the shoot tip, so actually enhancing transpiration of that shoot tip area. And then I'm going to show you the, the first experiment done by an engineer who has understanding of plant physiology, calcium, transportation, blah, blah, blah. But he did quite interesting experiment. So he had grown lettuce in the artificial lighting conditions. And then he put tubing going down to that. This is a skeleton, but this is a lettuce head, OK? So going straight above the shoot tip. So he created you know, two treatments. One is with airflow. The other one is no airflow and compare the tip band. So what he found was um, no airflow having 100% tip band. And airflow, he, he supplied air during the day and during the night. Both effectively um, suppressed the tip band. Okay, zero. So it's a dramatic difference between airflow, with and without airflow. And then he also measured calcium, you know, using isotope, and calcium concentration of, uh, let me see. Um, yeah, so this is, this is outer leaves, calcium concentration, without airflow, with airflow. Both are high enough, okay, outer leaves, because they are transpiring. Big leaves, you know, transpiring fine. So there, there is enough calcium supply to that leaf. Internal leaves, close to the uh, shoot tip, okay, without airflow, calcium concentration is way, way low. With airflow, because of the boundary layer reduction, enhanced localized transpiration, the internal leaves also have high um, calcium concentration. Therefore, it reduces the tip band. Okay? It's very, very um, nicely done um, study. And then um, researchers in Cornell University picked up and uh, implemented into this greenhouse design. So now we all know, sort of by uh, default, you know, if you have tip band in lettuce, you put the the vertical airflow funds. But there is a system like vertical growing system, multi tiered system, not so much head space. And in that case, creating vertical airflow is more challenging. So, indoor growing people, right, having a huge problem of tip band right now. And they are seeking for solutions, you know, how to deal with that. Because you can't really put the vertical airflow, all right? Um, we are going to talk about more about Tipan um, sometime later. All right, so um, uh, nutrient deficiency, this is a summary, and I'm using tomato as an example, um, where to look at and what is the typical symptom. Um, so this is a useful um, one slide showing all kinds of typical. And what we usually see is uh, iron deficiency, so the, the young leaves get yellow. Uh, manganese, uh, not manganese, sorry. Magnesium <laughs> deficiency, um, uh, older leaves, chlorosis. Um, sometimes potassium. And uh, what else we see? Um, and then calcium deficiency, tipan and uh, tip, not tipan so much, but uh, blossom and drop. So those are the typical tomato deficiencies we see. A um, good thing of hydroponics, as long as you use the right kind of nutrient solutions, you really don't see much deficiencies or toxicities. So um, like calcium or magnesium, those are environmentally related because transpiration related. So those are the ones you might see. And then also pH change, um, iron 
availability changes depending on the pH. So the pH increased too much, you know, increasing greater than 7, 7.5, and then you start seeing iron deficiency. Um, hydroponic nutrient solutions, it's complete solutions including micro and macro nutrient solutions. Um, different compositions, different formulas developed for different species. Uh, although we don't have good resource um, in this country showing, you know, here is a lettuce recipe, here is strawberry recipe, here is herb recipe, and that's something we need to develop in the near future, I believe. There is a textbook, um, hydroponics textbook, that had some table listing all kinds of available formula, but doesn't say which one is the best. But anyway, so, um, uh, um, Ideally, you want to develop a specific formula for specific crops. Um, key information for nutrient solution management, um, elemental concentration, what concentration for nitrogen, and what form, phosphorus and potassium and others, and pH and EC, very important. EC is an indicator of the total um, iron concentration, um, total concentration. Uh, so the EC provides electrical conductivity, provides the information um, on the um, general fertility level. So how much elements, how much um, concentrations of nutrients are in that solution. And we use as an indicator of salt accumulation. Um, uh, so you have usually the target solution uh, EC and in hydroponics, typically somewhere from one to three. Um, the unit is decisiemens per meter or millisiemens per centimeter. Um, so those are the unit. The last one? The last one? Yeah. Millimole. So the Siemens is uh, 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 inverse of ohm, and inverse of ohm is more because it's conductivity. So, so that's maybe more per centimeter. You probably don't see it, but just, just for <laughs> difference information. So you probably see mini Siemens or micro Siemens per centimeter um, or Desi Siemens. Desi Siemens per meter is more scientific because you don't want to use centi or whatever in a denominator. You learn that from SI unit. Um, I mentioned that, okay, all right. And EC is a good index for strength. So if you have a high EC, you, you expect there's a, a, a lot higher strength of the nutrient solution. So that's just showing the linearity between the strengths of the nutrient solution um, and electric conductivity. Okay, so this is a list of factors affecting nutrient uptake by the, by the plants and biological factors and environmental factors. Biological factors, plant species and, and uh, cultivars varieties. So um, specific requirement or preference um, coming from the um, uh, species and varieties. And then environmental conditions such as temperature, humidity, solar radiation, those are affecting transpiration, right? So that is affecting mass flow and therefore nutrient uptake is going to be affected. Um, and CO2 concentration for the growing speed, so that is also affecting you know, the uptake of the nutrient um, in the solution. And growing media, chemical capacity, uh, or chemical, uh, uh, chemical properties and uh, physical capacity, physical properties, those are affecting also the uptake rate of specific um, uh, ion concentration. So it's very complex, okay? So if you have a lot of time and passion, roots on environment is a great, you know, subject to research. Um, particularly if you look at the interactions between different elements, an interaction between substrate and nutrient um, uh, concentration or the uh, form, it's, it's very, very important area. Um, and more and more important because we wanna uh, uh, minimize the resource input for crop production and efficient use. You know, plants really don't think, it's mostly 
passively taking up the nutrient solution, but the result is different. You know, there is an optimum concentration range, different ratio. So that's why you know different species, different uh, formula are recommended. But it's not so much studies, in my opinion, there. Particularly interaction, different climate. You know, the, the what is recommended in humid environment may not be the best in the arid environment. So you know, those things need to look at. Um, so uh, da, 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 I think that's that's good. Um, and um, pH, we know, affect the. Uh, um, ion uptake, and then you might have seen this kind of chart, you know, nitrogen at different pH, availability changes, blah, blah, blah. It's so mu not so much for nitrogen, but I think the typical one is iron. Higher pH, then availability is going to be reduced. Therefore, we use chelated form of iron to make sure uh, even at high pH, iron is available. Oh, I need to, I need to cough. And uh, one study showing, I think, um, um, Fisher, Paul Fisher, did a lot of study on pH and substrate for floriculture <laughs> application. And this study is nicely showing um, media pH higher than uh, 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 6.5 6 or 7, um, iron concentration reduced in uh, um, tissue, and then showing a low chlorophyll concentration, so the yellowing of the, of the uh, tissue. Um, so this is a um, diagram showing interactions, um, plant physiology, ion uptake rate, um, uh, nutrient concentration and composition in the water, um, and then soil or media uh, affecting the availability um, through the cation exchange or pH. Um, and then, you know, this is a human factor, you know, what kind of fertil fertilization program. So it's all related. So it's very complex, you know, the root zone environment. It's, it's almost the same way in the aerial environment. You have an interaction between plant physiology, transpiration, uh, photosynthesis, and CO2, and, you know, BPD, and all air circulation. Same thing happening in the root zone. Okay. Last slide. Um, so typical irrigation management in the hydroponic system. Uh, we take a look at EC, which is again electrical conductivity as an indicator of total ion concentrations and pH, um, acidity, and uh, um, discharge um, of the solution. So how much um, uh, nutrient solution is going to be discharged? Um, in typical uh, uh, aggregate hydroponics, raw coal, coconut coal, like tomato or in our greenhouse, we target 30% as a target, you know, the discharge to make sure salts don't get accumulated in the root zone. Um, and uh, we, we get a good amount to analyze, you know, the EC and pH. So 30% is sort of a um, uh, uh, rule of thumb to manage the irrigation in the hydroponics. Um, strawberry, we target usually 10%. We don't need 30%. And depending on the crop, you can, you can change that. Um, in the open field, you probably provide more than 100% of water, or maybe 200% uh, or more water to the root zone because you get more discharge. And that's why um, leachate of the nitrate is more problematic in the soil because massive amount of water going into the system. Hydroponics, we have very small amount, therefore leachate is not gonna be the issue. Um, you know, this very small amount. Plus, you know, you are providing mostly the necessity uh, to the plants rather than, you know, creating a buffer in the root zone. Um, Irrigation management usually done by solar radiation. Uh, why? Because solar radiation is the driving force of the transpiration. So the transpiration basically taking up, you know, the, the water take up uptake speed. Transpiration and water uptake is, you know, basically uh, equal. Therefore, um, to manage the root zone, you want to estimate how much transpiration is likely happening 
and driving force is usually solar radiation. So the sensor can accumulate you know, the amount of solar radiation and decide the irrigation timing. And then I don't know what is the threshold. Does anyone know the threshold value? The, the greenhouse we, we know, the tomato greenhouse, is run by solar radiation. So the irrigation timing is not set using timer. It's driven by sensor accumulating solar radiation. Does anyone know what's the set point? It should be some kind of kilojoule per square meter or a joule per square centimeter. Does anyone know what's the set point? No? OK, so it's, it's probably empirical value. Do you know? No? Joule per centimeter, per square meter, per, se per square centimeter, most likely. But anyway. That doesn't make sense. Transpiration is not related to micromole. Micromole is a photosynthetic active radiation. Transpiration is a solar radiation, so it's a total energy. Yeah, that's what I would think. Um, yeah, and then what is a per second? So it never be the cumulative. So if it is cumulative, it has to be dual. But anyway, so that's that's a sort of energy balance, you know, driving force. So that's why dual or mega dual, whatever the unit is used. Um, you need to monitor nutrient status, um, visual observation, solution analysis. If something happens, and you send out tissue analysis. So that's typical. I think it's across the production systems you do that if you have issue. All right. Okay.